Um, and I'd like to invite our first speaker onto the stage, um, Professor Leo Trasande, who is director of the Division of Environmental Pediatrics at, at the NYU School of Medicine. Um, uh, Leo, you're, you're an expert in environmental health, particularly children, environmental health for children, um, and the impact of chemicals on hormones in our bodies. Interesting, you're also working on the economic costs of failing to prevent disease. You're very warmly welcome. Thank you. Please. It's an honor to be yours. here. Thank you so much. Um, What a warm introduction and quite an intimidating setting to be in. Um, Vasa's castle uh, being just such a grand location for such an important meeting. Um, I, I thought I would begin with some biographical stories. So I in some ways shouldn't be here at all. I'm a practicing pediatrician who uh, got very little information teaching, education about environmental health as a medical student and pediatric resident, lead poisoning, air pollution and asthma, nothing, not a word about endocrine disrupting chemicals. And um, it was through a legislative fellowship working for then Senator Hillary Rodham Clinton where I was exposed to environmental health and had my own personal aha moment, a tectonic shift in my own career that set me on the path of studying environmental contamination and trying to help us, help guide what we can do about it in the first place. But to set the stage for this conversation, I'm going to go to my pediatric roots in a way and I'm going to bring it to 2023 and we face three infectious challenges that are occurring at the same time. Some of you have probably heard a lot of media attention to flu occurring at the same time as the respiratory syncytial virus and their SAR, the novel coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2. Um, many have called this a triple-demic in which even though we now have vaccines for SARS-CoV-2, there's concern that there will be yet another wave of infections uh, that will wreak havoc across the globe. I would argue that we are amidst an even more challenging triple-demic of our own. And I'm not trying to be alarmist as I say it, we're losing biodiversity, we're facing epic increases in our climate, perhaps hitting the 1.5 C mark much rap more quickly than we could ever have imagined. And pla I'm gonna change it from plastics, to, from pollution to plastics. And um, this is a thesis I'm going to push very hard. Much of the pollution, the modern day pollution, not the legacy pollution that we face today is a byproduct of plastics. Now what's common to these three challenges our fossil fuel consumption and production. Um, so in the theme, in the spirit of synergy and thinking about solutions from a complex system standpoint, we really need to think broadly about the multiple interconnected challenges that we face at the core. So allow me to just go through that, but I want to emphasize, am I giving you feedback? Sorry. Thank you so much, sorry about that. Um, I'm going to argue at the end that we have vaccines for the other triple-demic. And there's solutions that are actively being explored today. And we have a leading opportunity to do so much for the next generations to come in the spirit of that video that really got my heart rate up. But we created this triple-demic ourselves. We funded this triple-demic. Look on the lower left, we have subsidies annually of $640 billion a year to fossil fuels that continue to this day. And just to provide some context, the impacts of biodiversity loss due to climate change are not equal. They're decidedly unequal. We're in a high-income country today, but the, uh, the places where fossil fuel is being consumed are proximate to major reservoirs of the remaining biodiversity that we have left on this planet. And these are in populations that often don't feel like they have the same political power 
as though many of us here in this room. And that to me is quite troubling. It's an arguably unethical and, and decidedly unequal. Um, many of you probably are familiar with the impacts of climate change on human health. Um, I think you've seen the, the global temperature change graphs in many shapes and flavors amongst this audience, and you see how it tracks so unfortunately closely uh, to the ongoing use of fossil fuels and consumption of fossil fuels. Um, the effects are many and will reverberate for decades to come. We've, been, we've put our heads in the proverbial sand, maybe in the proverbial oil um, on this challenge. Um, we're not just talking about air pollution and its effects on children's lungs, we're talking about heat and the effects on both ends of the cradle to grave continuum, but also um, on all of us, frankly. We're talking about early heart disease, uh, early mortality uh, from conditions that normally are thought of as just diet, an unhealthy diet and physical activity. Well, climate change is adding to that, um, putting us in, in greater peril. Infectious conditions, now I'm talking more about vector-borne diseases, are likely to increase as a result of increases in temperature in our planet globally. This is just scratching the surface of the broader effects of fossil fuel production and consumption that are at the core of what we're here to address today, I would argue. Um, there, it's much more complicated th than that, but from a root cause perspective, that drives much of what's going on. And when it comes to the work that I do day in and day out, and that's studying the effects of chemicals on human health, it's no secret, uh, particularly when it comes to plastics, that Plastics are an off-ramp for fossil fuel companies right now. If you can't burn it, you can make plastic out of it. And you can see the exponential increases, particularly again in low and middle income country based or, uh, uh, companies and in some places um, government affiliated entities that are producing and consuming plastic as that off-ramp under the guise of, well, we're not going to burn the fossil fuels, we're going to push it elsewhere. That is not a real solution. And just to emphasize the point, many, much of the polyethylene and polypropylene plastic that you're, you've probably inadvertently or, or will unwill, unwittingly used uh, comes from oil and natural gas. And as much as we'd like to think that we're trying to recycle our way out of this problem, or not, we have only cumulatively recycled 9% of plastic uh, over the, the lifetime of plastic since the, the era of The Graduate, um, the movie um, that some of you may be familiar with, in which uh, the famous line is, the future is plastics. Um, but suffice it to say that uh, we need more systemic solutions and ultimately we need a reduction of our use of plastic. And when it comes to the direct human health consequences of plastic, we're talking about bisphenols used in polycarbonate uh, cans and uh, thermal paper receipts. We're talking about phthalates used in personal care products, cosmetics and food packaging especially. We're talking about per and polyfluoroalkyl substances, the PFAS, the forever chemicals made so famous in Dark Waters, the movie by Mark Ruffalo. Um, we're talking about brominated flame retardants, which unfortunately are affecting the, the developing brains of young children, affected an entire generation of American children in which due to a California law, brominated flame retardants were added to every piece of furniture from 1975 to 2013, in which, um, the Europeans in, aud in the audience can be reassured that did not occur. And so we have a log full difference in levels between Americans and Europeans with consequences for human health that I'll allude to later on in the presentation. 
And finally, we've seen through disasters like the World Trade Center dis uh, disaster and East Palestine, the event where a truck with po polyvinyl chloride exploded, releasing heating acutely, a large amount of plastic. We've seen dioxins released, detectable in the levels of people living in the communities uh, cited near where these disasters occurred. But let me reassure you, unfortunately, this is not just a disaster-related phenomenon. This is not just a proximity to a hazardous waste site problem. This is a problem that all of us face. Now, the good news is the healthcare community has become increasingly aware of this problem. First, it was the Endocrine Society that I'm proud to be a member of. You can see my lapel today. Uh, in 2009, released the first scientific statement putting this issue on the proverbial map. I have to give credit to the Wingspread Conference that preceded it, but suffice it to say it was the Endocrine Society scientific statement that was arguably the biggest and first large flag. Soon thereafter, the World Health Organization on the lower left and the United Nations Environment Program put endocrine disrupting chemicals, which many of which come from plastics, and I've already explained how plastics come ultimately from fossil fuels, um, pointed this out as a global public health threat. There was much hand-wringing and debate but then the Endocrine Society, six years after the first statement, came out with its second scientific statement, with 1,331 scientific references, with human health effects directly conse consequent from exposures, not just effects of developing brains on young children and effects on populations that I care about, but effects on obesity, diabetes, reproduction, fertility, um, consequences that run from the entire cradle to grave. My own American Academy of Pediatrics particularly put emphatic emphasis on chemicals unintentionally intentionally added to foods. The obstetricians on the lower right are already communicating patient-based guidance to reduce exposure to these chemicals of concern. And you can see the World Obesity Federation putting policies to prevent obesity. This isn't a diet and physical activity phenomenon anymore when you're talking about the obesity and diabetes twin pandemics that we face today. And I am glad, but I'm also sad in a way to say that we're probably going to an era where we used to check childhood blood lead levels to a phenomenon where we're going to see organic contaminants become part of the regular clinical workup. The National Academy of Sciences in the United States now routinely suggests, arguably, that 100 million Americans should get routinely tested for PFAS levels due to their proximity to contaminated water sites. So this is becoming increasingly real and increasingly urgent for all of us, and it's increasingly costly. In the United States alone, and in Europe alone, the cost of endocrine disrupting chemicals are 163 billion euro a year, 1.2% of the gross domestic product. And that's less, based on less than 5% of EDCs, a subset of diseases due to the few chemicals we studied, and a subset of costs due to the few diseases due to the few chemicals we studied. So that 1% of GDP is an underestimate of an underestimate of an underestimate. And forthcoming, I'm happy to communicate that we'll be documenting the percentage of these costs that are ultimately related to plastics as well. In the US, the costs are higher, $340 billion. That's due to that unfortunate event where we added brominated flame retardants to every uh, piece of furniture, much of which is plastic, by the way, polyurethane foams in particular. And this is something that also kills us. We did a study documenting that 100,000 Americans die each year due to phthalate exposure uh, and resulting cardiovascular mortality in 55 to 64 uh, year olds with $40 billion of societal costs each year. So, and I, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that PFAS were not part of these estimates. We've just done a study documenting between five and $63 billion of additional costs due to the non-stick chemicals, just based on 13 conditions for which the evidence is the greatest. So we continue to scratch the surface of a more and more costly problem that someday will be on the global burden of disease estimates because it needs to be. It needs to be side by side with lead and air pollution and all the other contributors. Um, 
And there are some estimates suggesting substantial burden of disease globally in low and middle income countries. 400,000 low birth weights due to PFAS alone. So I'm gonna close by going full circle here. So many of you have seen vaccines such as Pfizer and Moderna. I'm sorry, I didn't have a Novavax uh, picture to add to this deck. Um, these are vaccines for SARS-CoV-2. I'm proud to say that now there's an RSV vaccine that many of us will be taking that we're just rolling out for pregnant women and children to prevent a serious morbidity associated with bronchiolitis and, and early respiratory infections in children. Vaccines are wonderful, in my opinion. We have to watch their safety, but so far the track record is extremely strong. I'm going to close by arguing that we have three other vaccines lined up. And it's your job to help guide the execution of these three vaccines. Now, one of the things I'm going to say which sets the stage is that, yes, the COP process has been one of those vaccines, but it's only made aspirational goals and set them. What we need in particular with the newest of the three vaccines, the Global Plastics Treaty, is we need a conscious requirement for countries to reduce, not reuse and recycle. Because we need to turn off the proverbial tap when it comes to plastic, and it's not really the plastic tap when we're turning off that tap, it's the fossil fuel production and consumption tap. So I look forward to comments on the panel, and it's, again, it's a real honor to be here. Thank you so much. <laughs> Leo, th thank you very much. You've set the stage magnificently by trying to connect uh, all of these interdependent and entangled problems. And you've really, really you know, given also a bit something of a call to action uh, on the plastics treaty and the importance of that of that reduction target, can I ask you, um, you know, given the audience we've got here today, we've got workshops taking place. Wh what would you like to see as a result of the discussions here today? What would you like these people in the room really to be taking with them when they leave? Uh, strategic steps for action and unified action. I think one of the things that I didn't allude to in the presentation is to when you get into a treaty discussion, let's say on biological diversity, the biological diversity people show up. We've even seen it to some extent, with all due respect to my colleagues on the, the Scientific Coalition for a Plastics Treaty, sometimes we, we, we do a really good job within that group, but sometimes people try to separate us as from the ocean plastic people to the chemicals people. We all need to work together. The plastics treaty is a chemicals treaty as much as it's a carbon treaty. Don't get me wrong, carbon's at the core, fossil fuels are at the core. But we've regulated 1% of chemicals globally that are used in plastics through Stockholm, through, mm. through, the, through the BRS and through other treaties. We are woefully behind. So it's a strategic plan for action. We have the data, we don't, I mean, we need to continue doing research, don't get me wrong. I'm a researcher, so I'm going to always say that. So I'm biased, but we need strategy and action. Thank you very much, Leo.